Most Sundays, I bring with me a bottled water here that I just took a sip of and I'm not pointing it out just to let you know I'm thirsty. This bottled water came from, I think, a Sam's Club probably. Not that that really matters, but the thing is, Sam's Club does not manufacture the bottled water. They simply sell it. Uh, there is a process that go, that takes the water from a spring in the ground to the bottled water that we see here. So it, let's say I run a, a water bottling company and uh, what I would have to do is I would start with a simple pump first because I want to get water from under the ground and uh, I need to get down to get that water. But let's stop right there, okay? So I need a pump. I don't manufacture that pump myself. I, I'm, you know, work, worried about getting the water out. I rely on someone else to manufacture a pump. And that person has to take some metal that someone got from the ground, fashion it into a pump and with all the electrical gadgets and everything. And then they sell me the pump and then I use it. So there's already a lot going on just to get to that early point in the process. So once the pump is ready to pump, I don't want to pump water up and have it spill all over the ground, so I need something to put that water in. So some kind of a big tank or vessel, I assume. I never worked for a bottling water company, but I'm assuming you would need something. So that's another thing that someone needs to, someone else needs to fashion metal into this big tank and sell it to me. And then once I have it in the vessel, I need a truck then because probably my water bottling processing plant isn't right there. And I might have a bunch of different uh, areas around the country, around the world where I'm getting water. So I need to truck the water to my purification plant. So the truck is a whole other part of the process that's created by someone else. Then... Uh, once the water gets to my plant, it's ready to be purified, and I got to run that through, I'm sure, a bunch of different other machines to make, get it into uh, the order where it can be uh, drunk by a normal person. All of that's made by other people, okay? So eventually, we get the water on the shelf that is fit to drink. And that's not even all of it because... Um, you see, I again, I don't have a big vat of water here with me. I simply have a bottle of water. So someone else has to make the plastic bottles for me. And they do that by getting petroleum or oil from the ground. And then they make the plastic bottle and the cap. And the process is actually a lot more complicated than I actually made it. But I hope you get the point here that how many people do you suspect are involved in the manufacturing process to get a bottle of water to the consumer and uh, to get it purified and ready to drink? Well, then, you know, once it's in that form, again, we ship it to Walmart and Sam's Club and Giant and all the retailers out there. So there's a lot involved in the whole process. Imagine the water bottling process without any oil. If we didn't have any petroleum, well, you'd have no bottle, as I just said. Or if you had no pump, it'd be very hard to get the water out of the ground to begin with. Or take out the big metal vat to keep the water in. Take out any one of these parts and the whole process falls apart. So notice how every point along the way is essential to bringing the water to the consumer. And that's where we see the church in a bottle of water. Every part of the church is essential to bringing the gospel message to those who have never heard it. First, though, before I get into this further, I want to go to the Bible. And just like last week, we read from two different letters from the hand of the Apostle Paul. Or actually, last week was one from Paul and Peter, but this morning will be uh, both from Paul. Uh, they're only with uh, 10 pages apart in your pew Bible, if you're following. The first is 803 
We'll read Romans 12, and then we will flip, and only three verses there. Then we'll flip to 8.13 and look at 1 Corinthians 12. So chapter 12 makes it easy to remember. So starting on 8.03 in Romans 12, verses 6 through 8, it says, We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Now flip over, if you will, to 8.13. And we will look at 1 Corinthians 12, uh, verse, probably start around, yeah, verse 4, and uh, go through 11. Right here. Okay. So 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working. But the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given the Spirit, through the Spirit, the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them to each one just as he determines. May the Lord's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Of all the letters that Paul wrote, that are preserved for us in Scripture. There are many others that he wrote, we know for a fact, that were not preserved in Scripture. But of those, these are two of his earlier ones, actually, in his uh, life. And uh, 1 Corinthians, if you're interested, came about two years before Romans. So <clears throat> this is really Paul laying the foundation of the faith for the early church. What I know is that Paul was trying to make the church understand uh, that Christianity is an active faith. And so we need to be doing things to further the kingdom. And to that end, he's letting the church know that God is equipping them with spiritual gifts so that they can effectively and efficiently uh, carry out his will. Uh, if we look at the brief passage in Romans first, just because it's shorter than the other, and Paul doesn't really expand on these gifts to any great extent. Uh, Paul lists seven different gifts in these three verses of Romans, and three of them have really no clarification at all, uh, as seen in uh, verse 7 and 8, where he writes, if it's serving, then serve, if it is teaching, then teach, if it's encouraging, that encourage and uh, not especially helpful in clarifying. Uh, sort of sounds like he's just repeating himself more than anything. So I think it's safe to assume that Paul's doing that because uh, he just simply didn't want to waste his time. These the people he was writing to already understood what these gifts were. So he's moving on to the other four gifts uh, that he clarifies. And he instructs that those who are endowed with the gift of prophecy should do so in accordance with the amount or level of their faith. And I'll repeat what I said last week, that when we talk about prophecy here, uh, it isn't necessarily delivering a message about uh, future events, although it could be, but we don't want to uh, restrict what we're talking about there. Uh, it could be as simple as preaching the word of God to someone or sharing a message uh, that God has given a person, uh, sharing it with another person. And it's something that you don't need a degree from a Bible school or from a seminary to do. God can inspire any of his children to prophesy in this sense. 
Um, and Paul tells us that the more faith you have, then the more you should use the gift and deliver good news to people. And this could also involve increasing the scope of the messages that we are giving to other people and learning more about God and making, uh, making sure that we understand things as we are helping other people in the process. Uh, the second gift that Paul talks about that he gives a little clarification on is that when we give, we should do so generously. And some people just have a gift of giving. And uh, now, what, what we uh, suppose oftentimes happens when God blesses a person with, say, a profitable, bu profitable business or, um, you know, a more lucrative income stream in their life, we think it's pretty safe to say that more often than not, the more money that a person gets, they're probably either going to save it or they are going to spend it. Or maybe they'll uh, invest it in other business activities to earn more and more money. You know, you have some wealth, you want to become wealthier. And that's a natural thing uh, for people to be involved in. Just think of the richest men in the world, richest people in the world. One in particular who shall remain nameless, but I'm sure you've all heard of this individual, I recently read this week that this individual, in, and I'm sure it's more than one, but this one in particular, uh, earns as much money in one second as many part-time workers in America earn in a week. Someone went through the, pro through the process of calculating that, and uh, I know that's a big range we're talking about, but the point is this person makes an awful lot of money on a regular basis. I don't know how much money any of what I call the ultra wealthy in this country and in the world give to churches and to Christian organizations. All I think of is what good they could do or can do. Hopefully they are doing so uh, with what God has blessed them with. And God gives the gift of generosity to some people, regardless of how much they have, by the way, and how much they earn. And they are just convicted to go over and above the call of duty, uh, over and above what the average person contributes. And did you know that on average, as people tend to earn more income, their giving drops as a percentage of their earnings? I've read several business journals about this phenomenon, and what jumps out at me is that they keep echoing this idea that, again, on average, not to say that there aren't exceptions that, you know, as people earn more, they give more, that would be, that does happen. But in general, the uh, idea is that poorer people understand more so the need to be generous than those who live more comfortably. The point is not to say that the total amount that a person gives uh, is what determines generous giving. Of course, uh, again, I go back to percentages. It's a way to put it on the same level. And uh, there's a big difference between a person who earns, say, $20,000 a year and they give away $2,000, that's 10%, Versus, say, I'll throw out a name, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, you know, the, the big names. Uh, who knows? They might leave a $2,000 tip at a country club. You know, I, I don't know what they spend their money on. So it's, you know, not all the same there. Moving on to the third gift, it talks about those who lead should do so diligently. And nobody wants to follow someone who is just wishy-washy, they aren't dedicated, or they're dedicated today, and then the next day they just seem aloof and don't care about it, and then they're just back and forth. Diligent leadership is so important in the church in many different ways. Uh, first thing people think of in terms of church leadership is probably the pastor, you know, supposed to lead the church, or maybe we'll even look at the whole denomination and we have an executive director, you know, who is in charge as well. But leadership really is everywhere. 
This is, there is leadership in a church council, uh, leadership in a Bible study. Someone has to decide what we're going to study, you know, when we're going to meet, all that kind of stuff. Even leadership in organizing a church dinner. You know, we're going to have a Christmas dinner coming up on December 5th. Someone has to sort of be in charge and make some decisions. So it doesn't have to be in an official position or even a paid position. Without leaders, no decisions are really ever made. We just sort of sit around, stare at each other, shrug our shoulders when we say, well, what do we want to do? When do we want to do it? How do we do it? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That kind of thing. So you need someone who is willing to take leadership. And when people agree to give of their time and effort and energy to the church, they want direction and they want to feel confident that this ministry is going to be carried out effectively and to completion. And the last gift in Romans in uh, verse is in verse 8 where it says, If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Now, you may not realize uh, this here, but the actual spiritual gift to show mercy uh, to people, this, this is sort of an interesting one to me, let me put it that way. Um, though some people are just endowed with a special gift to dispense mercy to others cheerfully. And believe me, it's not easy to do either. Uh, if there's any time that a person is called upon to be merciful to another person, more often than not, it follows a very difficult situation where emotions probably run high. You know, someone transgressed someone, did something they shouldn't have done. Maybe there's hurt feelings involved. And the initial reaction of most people is not to respond cheerfully. There's so much hurt and pain in the world. We know that just by turning on the TV any day and looking at the news. It makes people take notice and perk up and pay attention when someone reacts differently than everyone else does in tough situations. And when people live their lives expecting someone to hold a grudge after doing something that uh, you know they shouldn't have done or even fly off the handle and just be unforgiving. But if that person instead responds with cheerful mercy, then they're going to take notice. And this is simply a gift that God's given some people to exercise. Um, <clears throat> it's just another way that when someone asks you, why, why are you so cheerful in giving mercy? You know, it's just a way to respond to them and point them to sh share the gospel, basically, but point them to Jesus and say, it's because Jesus came into my life and he changed my life. And now I just want to be merciful to other people, just as he was had been merciful to me. Now, each one of these gifts could easily be its own message. Uh, but this is just an overview over three weeks. But having briefly looked at the gifts, the upshot here really is that these gifts are dispensed by God so that the church can function properly. It follows that every time a Christian then ignores or chooses not to exercise their gift, well, the church operates less effectively and less efficiently than it could. For instance, for every person who has the gift of mercy but doesn't uh, effectively exercise it, you're probably going to push someone away from God rather than draw them nearer. And that's a lost opportunity. And, uh, for, and it leaves the church in a worse position. It's the same way that every person that God equips with the gift of giving, for instance, but they keep it to themselves, you know, this week I'm, I'm just going to, you know, splurge a little on what I want. Um, it just uh, leaves the universal church with fewer resources and fewer funds. Um, it's about living out our faith by using these gifts God has given us. 
And these gifts are wonderful reminders, by the way, of God's grace that he has poured out on humanity. But the important thing to know is these gifts are not exercised on our whims and based on what we want. They are based on God's decisions when and how they should be dispensed. The Apostle Paul, who wrote both of these letters we briefly looked at, Romans and 1 Corinthians, he is a great example of this because uh, the Bible clearly shows Paul had multiple spiritual gifts, and among them, uh, I'll focus on his gift of healing. And we briefly looked at the, or mentioned it last week. But if you read in the book of Acts, there are several instances I want to bring to your attention to illustrate this. Uh, Take notes or jot down uh, chapter 20 in Acts. You may remember there's sort of a bizarre story of a, of a uh, man named Eutychus. And Paul was traveling through town and he was talking to people and he was teaching. And uh, he, he was teaching actually longer than he intended, well into the night. And yet the people were still just enthralled with what he was saying. Well, this guy named Eutychus, he goes and he sits in, uh, in the, on basically the windowsill. He gets a little drowsy, falls asleep. Guess what? Three stories high, he falls out the window, hits the ground and dies. Okay, Not exactly uh, the way that we want to end a church service, that's for sure. And uh, I think that's the first record of a person falling asleep in church too. So if anyone does that, I guess I'm in... Good, uh, good company because the Apostle Paul put people to sleep too, apparently. So what happens, though, is Paul hurries down to the guy and uh, he does, I don't know, just goes there. He doesn't really say how he did it. He says, don't be alarmed. He's alive. Okay, I guess that's just the day in the life of the Apostle Paul. So he heals, heals this guy, raises him from the dead, whatever you want to call now, not only did he heal him by uh, bringing him back from death, but later on in that book uh, of Acts, it says, And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick of a fever and dysentery. Paul went in to him and prayed, and he laid his hands on him and healed him. Just another healing by the Apostle Paul. That's what Paul does, apparently. So, that establishes Paul has a natural, well, not a natural, but a God-given gift of healing. Now, that's not my point here, okay? Paul, Paul heals people. If you would go to 2 Corinthians, Paul, one of my favorite passages in the whole Bible, I probably say that a lot, but I have a lot of them. Paul writes this, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. And he goes on to explain that he was not healed of this thorn in the flesh. To that, for me, brings a question. Why was Paul able to heal other people but not himself? Well, the answer is our last point this morning. It's not just healing, and, but it's all of these spiritual gifts as I said, they are not exercised on our whims, but by the pleasure and the grace of God. It's a good way to keep us humble, for one thing, and Paul uh, alludes to that idea in 2 Corinthians. So let's say, for instance, that I'm a miracle healer, and I heal the first three people I come in contact with, but number four is on the, uh, you know, at the door of death, basically, I try to heal number four, doesn't work, and that person sadly dies. Well, most people in my shoes would say, what did I do wrong here? I could do one, two, and three, but not four, and that's just it. It's not my power. It is God's power through me, and it's God initiating that. When I heal victim number two and number three, I might start thinking, hey, I'm pretty good at this healing thing. You know, people are going to come to me. I'm going to be popular, whatever. That's when number four sort of knocks me down a peg, gives me some humility. And in the case of Paul's thorn in the flesh, 
I didn't read, I intentionally didn't read to you the pre preceding words to that. He said he knew after the fact God had revealed to him it was, quote, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in the flesh. So I think that's our answer right there. We need to always be careful with these spiritual gifts too. If I have a gift of giving and say God blesses me with a lucrative business uh, so I can afford to bankroll many uh, really good Christian missions in the world and uh, I realize where I should realize where my wealth is coming from. It's all because of God. He knows that he can trust me to use what he has given me through my business for furthering the gospel. Now, if I start slacking a little bit on my giving and I say want to take a trip to Hawaii that I've had my eye on for, uh, for quite some time, uh, guess what's probably going to happen? Well, I think God's not going to be blessing my business as much because he's going to see that I'm not a faithful steward of giving. And nothing against going to Hawaii, if anyone here plans on going there, continue to go. And just the point is you don't want to have do that at the expense of what God has already called you to do. But you can apply this concept to all of the different gifts we've talked about, uh, but uh, really not much of a point in spending a lot of time illustrating each one sort of the same thing over and over again. So I will be closing out soon, but as I was preparing this message, my mind went back just a few weeks to when Travis Helm was here from the conference and he shared to us about the missions. And remember how he talked about this 1040 window on the map uh, from Northern Africa and the Middle East and into, uh, uh, they call it Asia, Indonesia. And in that area of the world is 85% of the people who are, have not been reached by the gospel. Um, did you know or do you remember, actually, how Travis told us how there's people literally in the deserts of Africa who will recognize a Coca-Cola logo, but if you ask them if you ever, if do you know Jesus, they think you're talking about the guy in the next town over. Well, I did some research on my own after that, and Coca-Cola was introduced in 1886, 134 years ago, if you want to do the math. So 134 years, Coca-Cola has reached over 90% of the globe. Jesus Christ was introduced, I'll just use the common figures of 2020 years ago, and uh, the church has only reached 50% of the globe. Uh, I think at least some of the reason, maybe more so than we want to think, is because of these spiritual gifts. And the average person, average Christian, either doesn't know about the gifts that they have, they're not aware of them, or sadly, maybe they don't even care to exercise them to their fullest. It uh, doesn't mean we have to pack up everything after we leave church today and move to the 1040 window and start telling people about Jesus, but uh, it's just that wherever we are, the spiritual gifts build up the, the church, God's worldwide church. And uh, it brings pe more people to that knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, and maybe God does want me to go and pack up and move there and to minister to the people of nations like Eritrea and Djibouti and Bahrain, countries that maybe some of us never even heard of some of these places before. And if so, that's between me and God. But my decision to obey God and go there affects many people in those nations, the people that I would come in contact with if I were to obey God. And um, so back to my bottled water quick for a minute here. I'm just going to roundly estimate 2 billion Christians in the world today. Some people might wonder, what does it matter if I don't use my gifts to their fulfillment, um, there's, that means there's 
1,999,999,999 other people out there to pick up the slack. So not that big of a deal. Uh, but we can't say that about even a bottle of water. Uh, again, what if no one mines the oil? Or that we have no bottle? What if no one pulls the uh, metal from the ground? We said that's a big problem, several different uh, ways in that process. All these kind of things, there's so many different intricate parts and just bringing a simple bottle of water to a consumer. Imagine how much more important it is for all the parts of the church to be working together. I said it before and uh, a couple weeks ago, Travis echoed the sentiment when he said, there's more than one person every second who passes from this world into eternity uh, separated from God. God calls each one of his children to play a role in the church and bring others to Christ. I don't care if you're the thief on the cross who thankfully for him came to faith and called on Christ in his dying breath, or if you're like a Billy Graham who came to faith as a, as a teen and many people uh, estimate that he actually ministered to more people than the Apostle Paul in his life. Uh, no matter who it is, what role you play, there is no insignificant role. So if you're here today and if you're unsure of your spiritual gifts, I urge you to read and reread uh, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, Romans 12, uh, Ephesians 4 is another one because there's many options from the hand of Paul there. Uh, hint, hint, that'll be next week, by the way. And uh, just remember the bottled water. Maybe you're the oil, maybe you're the metal, maybe you're the truck or an untold number of other materials in the process. We may not think of them important individually, but they're all a significant part of the process. If you take away one, you'll see what happens very quickly. The bottle of water no longer exists in the way that we see it and use it today. And what I'm talking about here, though, God's church, so much more important than a bottle of water. Bottled water can give us life, but God's church, now that can give us springs welling up to eternal life. And that's what we are all a part of, and we all play a role in that, and it's a role that God has established for each and every one of us. Let's close now with a word of prayer.